Today we begin a new series called Starts Here. And this morning we will look at how making the world better starts here. And it starts with bringing others to Jesus. So take a moment now, prepare your heart for today's service. So if you'll join me, it is in Luke 5, 17 through 26. It says, One day, while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of the religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men carrying, came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is, that blasphemy? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or stand up and walk. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, We have seen amazing things today. Father God, we thank you for the amazing things that you put in our life. Father God, as Pastor Brian was talking about, if we just, and in the song it says, if we just make room, Lord, that you will fill that space, Father God. So we thank you that right now we have prepared hearts, Father God. We have ears to hear, Father God, as Jesus would always say, those who have ears, let them hear, Father God. So as you work through Pastor Javen today, Father God, that we hear your word, Lord, and that we put it into the new open room in our lives, Father God. So we thank you for it. helps to have an amazing time here in service, an amazing time this afternoon, Father God, in the cookout, Lord. We just thank you for it. In your name, amen. Uh, I have this uh, board with me. Uh, this this board sits in my office on a, on a shelf behind my desk in my office. It actually originated, uh, came, uh, came into existence with me. Uh, when we did a, when I was youth pastor, we did a series. We went to a, well, we went to a youth retreat together as uh, as a group, and I did these messages, and it kind of went around the theme of that weekend. But the board, it just has a saying on it. It says, "What man is a man uh, who doesn't leave the world better?" All right, that's a good sentiment, right? What man is a man that doesn't leave the world better? This actually comes from a Latin phrase that was uh, made popular in a movie uh, many years. Ago, uh, but it's a great sentiment because who doesn't want to leave the world better? Or try to make the world better. If you don't want to make the world better, okay, and then you want to make what do you want to make it worse? I don't know, but anyway, um, so that's a good sentiment, right? But here, there is a small little issue with that because the issue that comes in is okay. Well, how do you define better? Because the way you define better and what you think might make the world better may not be the way I think will make the world better. Maybe the way that I think the world will be better isn't the way that you think the world can be better. You see the issue there. This is the issue that we see happening all through our nation and all through our world. Because there's people that define what's going to make things better, right? And what is the definition of better? I want you to keep that in mind as we go into this series that we are starting today. The series that we're starting today is going to help us to remind us that mission for God does not require airfare. It doesn't require luggage. Now we are a church that believes in sending people out on mission and on missions trips. In fact, we have a missions trip coming up in October to Belize. If you haven't, if you would like to go on that, if you're interested in something like that, there's information about it on our website. You can talk to us. The uh, uh, half of that payment will be due by the end of this month to set up uh, uh, plane tickets and things of that nature. But you can jump. Don't let that scare you. Don't let that uh, worry you. Can I do that? We'll help you know point you in what you need to do and what you can do to help raise those funds and get those funds and take care of it. But um, but we do this. We're a church that we have sent teams to uh, many teams to the Dominican Republic because Matt and his family were missionaries in the Dominican Republic for many years. So we sent uh, teams to the Dominican Republic often. We've sent teams to Ecuador, to uh, to Guatemala, to Mexico, to Honduras. Uh, we have sent teams, believe it or not, to Jamaica and the Bahamas. 
Because if you didn't know or not know it, uh, when you get outside that two mile resort, luxurious, wealthy stretch, nothing but poverty. Right. That's why they don't let you go outside that stretch when you're there. So we were in that other part. Right. So we've sent people there. We've sent people to states in our nation and cities in our nation, to Louisiana, to Mississippi, to New York. We, we believe in sending teams out. But we're also a church that believes that missions for God is simply defined as the mission of God at work. It's the, it's the mission of God at work. We have opportunities around us every day to be a part of the mission of God. And sometimes those opportunities might come in the form of interruptions in our life. Sometimes they might come in the form of what we consider inconveniences to our life. But those opportunities are open doors for us to be what we call and what we encourage you at the end of every service every week is the opportunity to be catalysts for transformation. And to see God work and transform people's lives. The passage of scripture that Matt read for us this morning in Luke chapter 5. I love this encounter with Jesus. It it may be one of my most favorite encounters that you read about uh, in the Gospels. But in this passage of scripture, Jesus himself is faced with one of these opportunities. It's it's, It's an opportunity where Jesus defines for us what better actually is. It's a moment in Jesus's time when he's teaching inside of a home where he's interrupted. But what Jesus teaches us and what he points out is if we want to make the world around us better, if we want to make things better, then Jesus shows us that better actually starts with one important decision. And that's what we're going to look at. Uh, today and as we start this series. Now, you heard the story that Matt read. You've got a group of friends that have a paralyzed friend who's lame, can't walk, can't do anything. And they've heard about Jesus. They've heard about what he can do. They've heard about all the miracles that he's done. And so like, if we can get, G, uh, get our friend to Jesus, then we know that he can do for him what he needs done for him, right? We know if we can just get him to Jesus, that's going to make all the difference. So they go to this house where Jesus is teaching, but the house is packed. I mean, there's standing room only. People are standing in the doorways that you can't get in the house to hear Jesus talk and to hear Jesus teach. But they are determined not to let this stop them from getting to Jesus. Right? I mean, they don't even have the patience to just wait till he's done and he walks out the house and they start, hey, 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 over here. They don't have the, they, they're like, we got to get to him now. We got to take advantage of this opportunity. So they go up on his roof and they start picking some dude's roof apart to lower the guy through the ceiling, right? Imagine you are in that home and that's your home. And all of a sudden you start seeing a little dust going, what is going on up there? Then it's all of a sudden you see this little peak of sunshine come through. What in the world, right? And then you see holes start to manifest. Who is on my roof? They're trying to now get out the house, figure out who is on my roof, right? What is going on? And these guys are up there. They peel back the tiles of the roof and they lower their friend down to Jesus. Why? Because their mindset was we have brought our friend to Jesus because we know if we get him to Jesus, Jesus can what? Heal him. And their mindset is this. If Jesus can heal him, it's going to watch this, make his life better. And you have to think that this guy is thinking the exact same thing. If, if Jesus can heal, if I can get myself to Jesus, they can help me get to Jesus and Jesus can heal me. I'll be able to walk. I'll be able to move around. I'll be able to do things in my house. I can even come back and fix the hole in this guy's roof. I'll be able to work. Why? Because Jesus can heal me and he can make my life. What? Better. But when this guy is lowered through the roof and he's down there in front of Jesus, Jesus stops teaching. Why would you not, right? Because this is a definitely an interesting situation that's taking place. Some dude's being mission impossible right down through the ceiling. And so he stops and he looks at the guy and he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Can you imagine the thoughts going through the friend's Mine's like, wait, wait, what? Your sin. We did not bust a hole through this roof for you to tell my man that his sins are forgiven. And the dude laying on the mat, can you, can, I mean, does his heart sink? Like, is he sitting there thinking, uh, it's not like him. You're misreading the situation, I think, Jesus. 
But he looks at him and he says, Friends, your sin, friend, your sins are forgiven. Because what Jesus is doing is he's demonstrating in this moment that the most urgent need in your life is for your sins to be forgiven. The most urgent need in your life is for a healing of your soul. A healing from the damages of sin that sin has done to your soul. That's the most urgent need in your life. The most urgent need in your life is for your heart and for your life to be reconciled to the Father, to your Creator, to the one who made you. And it's in this moment where it's like Jesus is looking at them and he's looking at everybody around him. He's saying to everybody in that room, everybody on the roof and everybody outside of the building from, and not dis, not limited by time to now. He's saying to every one of us, you want to make the world better. You want to make your life better. You want to make the world around you better. You want to make your community better. You want to make your workplace better. You want to make your neighborhood better. You want to make things better in your family better world starts when your identity is formed in your creator. That is the start of a better world. Not how your feelings say, not how your heart says. Jeremiah, the prophet, tells us that the heart is deceptive. So your creator says you are. So that means you've got to get around. Your creator, you've got to get around and spend time with Jesus. And that disturbed the people in that room. They messed with them. They began to, glares began to happen. You know, people were looking across the room. People start whispering. Right? Luke tells us the debate going on because people are looking at each other like, who, who does he think he is? And they're whispering to each other. What did, did he say that he forgave his sins? Only God can forgive sins. What, what is he talking about? He can't forgive his sins. They're questioning. There, there's this disturbance that's happening because for someone to forgive someone, it means you forgive someone of something done to you, right? I mean, think about it. If, if, if I walk some, to a married couple after service this morning and I tell them, hey, guys, I know about the fight that took place before you got here today. You know, I, I, really, I know about that. And y'all, y'all threw some good jabs at each other. I mean, some were really funny. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, and, and, and Johnny, you went, you went really low. You know, and uh, you, you maybe crossed the line with Susie and you said some things that shouldn't, you, you, you shouldn't have said. But Johnny, I just want you to know, I forgive you. I forgive you. I mean, you know, Susie's going to be glaring at me the same way the people in this room are glaring at each other, right? Who do you think you are, right? Susie's probably going to want to slap me in the face. That I'm forgiving him because it's not normal to typically go and to forgive someone for something that wasn't done to you. And that's what these Pharisees and the people in this house were talking about. Who does he think he is to forgive? Only God can forgive. And Jesus is looking around and he's saying, exactly. Only God can forgive. And I'm God. See, People will try to say that in these early gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that the writers never put in there that Jesus claimed to be God. That John is the one that predominantly did that. He's the one that mentioned all the I am statements of Jesus. He's the one that constantly talked about how him, Jesus, and the Father are one. And John did that because John was trying to convince people or get people to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they were written and started circulating earlier than John. So they didn't really do that. But, oh, contraire. Because it's in these writings, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell of this encounter. And in this very moment, they are showing that Jesus is pointing to his deity. The very first thing that Jesus does is he, he, he makes known that, look, I don't have to hear what you're saying to know what you're saying. In fact, you don't even have to mouth your thoughts for me to know your thoughts. <laughs> He's God. He knows what they're thinking. He knows what's on their heart. He knows what's going through their mind. And so he begins to get them to question their own thinking. Because this is a group of people that thought they knew the best way. They were so very certain of everything that they knew. 
And Jesus was trying to get them to reconsider and understand that there was a better way for them standing right in front of them. There was a better way to everything that they had known, everything that they think they know. And so Jesus looks at him and he says, all right, he's going to, he's going to confirm his deity even more. And he looks at him and he says, what's easier? Is it easier for me to say to this person, your sins are forgiven? Or is it easier for me to say to this person, get your mat and walk home? A guy that can't walk. Well, obviously it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Because if you're to tell this person to get up and walk, they would have to do it. So Luke tells us that Jesus then looks at the guy and says, take up your mat and walk. And then he tells us that the guy immediately jumped up and ran out of that place celebrating and praising God for what he had done in his life. It's the ultimate mic drop moment. I mean, what can you say to that? Because Jesus is saying, look, you guys are reasoning right now. You're reasoning in your mind. I can't be God. That's the reasoning going on in your mind. Because you know that only God has the has the power and the ability to forgive people of their sins. But you also know that only God can heal someone. So if only God, in your reasoning, if only God can forgive someone's of sins and only God can heal someone, then I'm going to go ahead and heal someone to show you that I can also forgive sins. He says, you want to reason? Let's reason. If I can do the verifiable one, and that's heal someone and you can watch it happen, then you can be guaranteed that I can do the unverifiable one. And I can forgive this man of his sins that he's committed against God. Why? Because he's also committed those sins against me. Jesus is saying in this moment, me and the Father are one. Through his actions, through what he did. And see, for you and for me, Jesus' death and his resurrection, they verify the claims that he can forgive us of our sins and give us a whole new life. Because the spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the same spirit that raises us into a new life in Christ, his resurrection proves his claims. And then Luke tells us that the people were gripped with wonder. And they said, we've seen something amazing take place in this place today. Other translations say, we've seen something unexpected. We've seen something uncommon. We've seen something incredible. We've seen something wonderful take place in this room today. That word there in the Greek is the word paradoxos. So what was happening in this room and in this moment and in the presence of Jesus was something paradoxical. There was a paradigm shift that was happening in the minds of every person in this room. That the truly better way, the truly better change that our world needs, the truly better change that the world around us around us needs takes place through that man, Jesus Christ. That's where better starts. And listen, we have opportunities around us all the time to make the world better by pointing them to the one who is the best way. That's the opportunity we have around us all the time. The opportunities we have around us, they're they're open doors for us to help people see their greatest need or to remind people what their greatest need is. And listen, that your greatest need may be more important than your greatest desire. Because see, this man and this man's friend's greatest desire was to see him healed. But Jesus said, that's not your greatest need. And see, sometimes we confuse our greatest desire with our greatest need. Our greatest need is him. It's being in his presence. It's being with Jesus. It's allowing him and his Holy Spirit to lead us, to direct our life, to guide us. That's our greatest need. And then we give him our desires and let him work in our desires as he sees fit. But I wanted us, so I told you this, this encounter is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but I wanted us to see Luke's account because Luke, Luke uses a statement that Matthew and Mark don't, don't use. It's, it's in verse 17, and he makes this little statement in Luke chapter 5. He says, the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. And Luke just kind of makes that statement. And that word power is the word dunamis. 
right? It's important to understand that. It's important to realize that. Because we look at this and we say, well, of course God's power was with Jesus. He was God. And of course Jesus is going to do things that I can't do because he's God. And he's going to work in ways that I can't work because he's God. Right. That's why we always point to Jesus. But I want us to get something. I want us to understand something. If you realize it or not, if you knew it or not, Luke is actually a first, part one of a part two book series. Okay, Luke is his first writing. The book of Acts is his second writing. Okay, what Luke does in his first writing in the gospel of Luke is to show us everything that Jesus did when he walked this earth. Everything he did to change the course of history. Everything he did to make the world better. He's pointing out through the book of Luke. When he writes the book of Acts, he's pointing out to us everything that God did through his early church to make the world better, to change the world around him. And everything that he wanted to pattern to do through the church continually. And look at how he starts when he goes into his second book, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Look at what he says. He says, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, this this is who he's writing to. He says, I told you this about everything Jesus, what? Began to do and to teach. In other words, what Jesus did was just the beginning. He was the originator of a better way. What he did was he started something and put it into motion for the early church to continue and for the church to keep rolling. Because the word that he, Luke goes on in Acts chapter one, it says that as they spent time praying that the power of the, the, the spirit came on them and he powered them. That's the word dunamis. Same power, same power. He empowered them, Luke says, to be his witnesses. In other words, to point to something, to be his witnesses in Jerusalem Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. Jerusalem first. Why? Jerusalem was their home. Why is that important? Because the mission starts here. It started where they were. And then it expanded. But he empowered them. And he empowered them to point to the way that is the best way. He just started it. The same spirit empowers us today to truly make the world around us better because he empowers us to be witnesses of Jesus Christ who is the better way. He empowers us to serve the world around us in a better way. He empowers us to discern when the opportunities that are happening, when the interruptions that are happening around us to discern, is this an interruption that's allowing me to do ministry for God or is this an interruption that's keeping me from what God is calling me to do? This Holy Spirit empowers us to be used for God instead of being distracted from God. He empowers us. But I also want us to notice that combined with the power of the Spirit, Luke tells us that the Spirit power was in Jesus. Combined with that spirit was the faith of these friends. When you combine faith with the empowerment of God, he can do some amazing, incredible things. Now, I'm not saying that to make you question your faith because some people have done that before and they say, well, you don't have enough faith because there's a lot of factors that can play into why God may be not moving in the way that you wish he was moving. One of those may be God's timing. If you remember the, story, the account that we looked at from Easter when we talked about Lazarus, Jesus's timing was not Mary and Martha's timing and it absolutely was not Lazarus's timing, right? God's timing is not our timing, it's different. The apostle Paul taught that sometimes people, God works through people to plant seeds, sometimes God works through people to water seeds. In other words, what, what Paul is saying is God may work through you in a way that you weren't expecting him to work through you. You may be thinking he's going to work through me this way, but he might work through you another way. We talked about last week when we were ending our series on her story and we talked about how Paul wanted to go to Asia, but God didn't send him to Asia. He sent him to 
Macedonia, where he went to Philippi, where he met a woman from Asia. God's ways are not our ways. The point is you need to have faith because faith does play a part. There's no doubt that faith plays a part. When you look in scripture and you look in the gospels, you see that Jesus went to his hometown and he wasn't able to do the things that he was doing in other cities. Why? Because they, people didn't believe that Jesus was who he said he was. Their faith was not there. It was not a scarcity of the power of God that was the problem. It was a scarcity of faith. People didn't believe The gospels tell us several accounts where Jesus was amazed at someone's faith or he was impressed with someone's faith. Faith. Combine your faith with the empowerment of the spirit and then watch how God can truly use you to make the world a better place. To make the world around you a better place. The friends... That day they saw that they had a need. And what they knew was that Jesus had an answer. Now, the answer Jesus had came out a little different than the way they thought. But the bottom line was they had a need and they knew Jesus was the answer. It's no different in our world today. No different. We have problems and we have needs. Jesus is still the answer. Here's the thing. These friends were disturbed by what was taking place in their friend's life. That he was lame. They were disturbed that no one around these Pharisees who claimed to know God, they often walked by him and ignored him. And they were disturbed. But because they were disturbed, they were moved to press into Jesus. So I just want to end today by asking you some questions. <clears throat> what disturbs you? When you look around, when you look around your world, and you look around the world today, what disturbs you? What breaks your heart? When you look at the community, when you look at the city, when you look at our county, when you look around where you live, when you look in the school systems, when you look within your family, when you look within your neighborhood, when you look within your kids' friends, if you have kids, if you look at them, their friend groups, what catches your attention about what's happening and what disturbs you? Teenagers, when you look around at your peers, does anything disturb you about their life? What breaks your heart? What needs to be done around you that God may be empowered you to help make a difference and make things better? In what way can God use you to bring change? In what ways can God work through you to point to a better way? That's what we're going to talk about in in these next few weeks. And I say we because it's not just going to be me. It's going to be uh, Pastor Caleb, Pastor Brian is going to help in this series in two other weeks. Pastor Caleb next week. And they're going to talk about, we're going to talk about ways that God could use us to point to Jesus, the one who is the better way. But we have to understand that it starts with looking past ourselves. It starts with understanding that as long as everything in this life is about me, then I can't really be about anything else. That living this life for me is a very empty way to live. That what Jesus did for me and what Jesus did for the world was the most important thing. And when I understand it for myself, I understand that I don't need to keep it to myself. And Jesus even taught that if you live this life solely for yourself, you're going to find out in the very end that that was a very empty, lost, and wasteful way to live. The best thing that you can do for you has very little to do with you. The best way to make the world better is to point the the world to the one who is the best way. Look past yourself. Realize that God has empowered you. 
He's given you opportunities around you. He's given you ways around you. He's given you things around you that you can do to point the world to the better way. If, if you're having a problem seeing those, you're having a problem of finding what your place is, pray. Pray for God's spirit to work through you. Pray for God to show you the opportunities that are around you, to let your eyes be open, to see those opportunities, to not be too distracted by what you're doing throughout the day that you miss the opportunities that he's putting right in front of you. Pray for awareness. Pray for discernment. Ask God to let his spirit pray through you, to guide you. Then have the faith to step out and let God use you. And you say, Jamie, that's not as easy to do as it is to talk about. And you're right. It wasn't easy for Jesus either. It wasn't easy for the disciples when the early church started doing it. It was never meant to be easy. But anything worthwhile, you know this, isn't easy. For God to use you and to make a difference through you, it may mean pulling you out of your comfort zone. It may mean having you do things that feel a little bit awkward. It may mean having conversations that feel a little awkward that you don't know if you're prepared for. And and that's okay. Remember this. What broke God's heart, what broke Jesus' heart, is what compelled Jesus to come to this earth and pursue the cross. What broke his heart was our sin, our greatest need. That's why the gospel writers wrote and tell us that when Jesus would see people, he would be moved in his gut because he looked out at people and he saw a group of people who were lost like sheep without a shepherd, lost in their sin. He hurt, he ached, he was disturbed by the sin that people were allowing in their life and in the world and it broke his heart. And it wasn't comfortable for him to do it. We know that because John tells us that he prayed in the garden. God, if you could, please take this cup from me. But not my will, but your will be done. He laid aside his own selfish desire, not calling Jesus selfish. He laid aside his desire of not wanting to go to the cross. To do what his father had willed for him to do. Making the world better sometimes means setting aside our will. And the writer of the Hebrews says that for the joy set before him, he pursued the cross. He endured the cross and scorned his shame. Why? Because he knew that the only way to make the world better was to lay aside his will and let the power of God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, work through him and raise him from the dead which would in turn empower and embolden a movement of people that would continually point others to him. It's the best way. It's the only way. So how are you making the world better? The best place to start is here. To start here. To start every day. And the best thing to do is to point people to the one who is the best way. Why? Because he's the only one that can bring the change that people need. Amen. Stand with me this morning. I want to encourage you today that if you're here and you've never allowed Christ to to change your life, if you've never received what he's done for you, receive that. He pursued a cross and took your death or took your sin through his death. And he freed you from sin to make your life better. Not to make everything around you perfect, but to make your life better because he makes your life better by helping you endure through everything in life and handling everything better. He gives you a different perspective. He gives you a different way to see the world. Jesus makes things better. Cry out to him today. 
He can save your soul. If you came in here lost today, He can give you direction. Just cry out His name. Say, Jesus, forgive me. and Change my life. Let me live my life for you. If you look at the world around you, and as I ask those questions, you begin to think immediately about things around you that you know are not great, that need to be better. The only thing that's going to make those things better is by Jesus working in those things. By pointing people to Jesus, because Jesus brings change. And just the mention of his name sends the devil running. There's power in the name of Jesus. If you need prayer in any way today, we would love for you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, bwccambin.com, go to our contact page. You'll find a link there to uh, request prayer or send us anything that you uh, would like to communicate with us today. Or you can also simply text the word prayer to 803-676-7566 and we will be back in touch with you to find out how we can be in prayer for you. God bless you. We hope that you have a great week.